Hello and welcome to Diabetes Connections in the News. I'm Stacey Sims and these are the top diabetes stories and headlines of the past seven days. As always, I will link up my sources in the Facebook comments where we are live and they'll be in the show notes at diabetes-connections.com when this airs in a couple of days as a podcast so you can read more and get all caught up on sources when you have the time. Our top story, a new oral drug to prevent type 1 is moving along in trials. Right now it's called IMT. 002, and put very simply, it's meant to block a genetic trait that increases the risk for the disease and is seen in the majority of patients. It's a new way to think about treating type 1. Phase 2 studies could start next year. It's thought this could help with other autoimmune diseases as well. The next condition these researchers want to tackle is celiac. Could the global rise in diabetes have an environmental component in an advances in pharmacologic in an advances in pharmacology article, researchers say routine exposure to chemicals that disrupt our endocrine systems play a role in triggering diabetes. These researchers say we often attribute patients' disease risk to individual choices. We don't necessarily think about how systems and environments play into disease risk. They go on to say that so-called lifestyle factors like exercise and diet fail to fully account for the dramatic rise and spread of diabetes. A new study shows black children are less likely to start or continue with a CGM after a type 1 diabetes diagnosis. These researchers at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, or CHOP as it's commonly known, show that a racial ethnic disparity in CGM use begins within the first year after diagnosis. White children were more than two and a half times more likely to start CGM compared with black children and twice as likely to start CGM compared with Hispanic children. There was a disparity here even when broken down by types of insurance, commercial or government. And these researchers say social determinants, including structural racism, are likely playing a role in disparities in care and in outcomes. Very large survey of women shows that half of those with type 1 or type 2 diabetes are not getting pre-pregnancy counseling. This study included more than 100,000 women. Right now, guidelines from many groups, including the CDC and American Diabetes Association, recommend providers offer women with diabetes health counseling before pregnancy to cut down on the increased maternal and infant risk associated with both conditions. These researchers hope to develop better tools for women and for their doctors. Big increase for time and range when kids use hybrid closed loop systems. Now we've heard a lot about improvement, but in this study, the percentage of kids and teens with T1D spending at least 70% time in range more than doubled after three months of using Tandem's Control IQ system. This was a study about 200 kids, median age was 14, and it was a real world study. So the kids went about their lives, they were not in a clinical setting, and the researchers pulled the data electronically. Interesting, sleep mode use increased through six months, while the exercise mode was used less over time. Kids with an A1C over nine saw the most improvement. Those with an A1C under seven didn't see much of a change. Dexcom gets FDA clearance for real-time APIs. What does that mean? Well, third-party companies like Fitbit or SugarMate, which have long integrated Dexcom data, have been doing so in a bit of a delay. Now they can do so in real time. API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a software, like a go-between, that allows two applications to talk to each other. Dexcom's partner web APIs will allow users to view all of their diabetes care data in one place to enable in-the-moment feedback and adjustments, the company said in this announcement. There is a cool new exhibit at Banting House, Recent guests of the podcast and uh, museum celebrating the birthplace of insulin. They're set to open again this week, the first time since March 2020. And there's a new computer generated exhibit. It does work outside in the square where Dr. Banting's statue stands, giving visitors a virtual glimpse at the life and work of the man credited for the discovery of insulin. If you haven't visited, it's in Canada or seen the museum online. I highly recommend spin around the website and we'll link it up. The Summer Olympics are kicking off, and by now you have probably heard that American trampoline gymnast Charlotte Drury was just recently diagnosed. She found that she had type 1 weeks before the 2021 Olympic qualifying trials. She revealed on Instagram last week she and her coach pressed on, and 
she basically got back into it within three weeks. She posted this photo of herself wearing the Dexcom. Drury is the first American woman to win a gold medal in trampoline at World Cup. And that is Diabetes Connections in the news. If you like it, please share it. And feel free to send me your news tips, Stacy at diabetes-connections.com. Please join me wherever you get your podcasts for our next episode. On Tuesday, I will share my conversation with gold medal Olympian Gary Hall Jr. When he was diagnosed in 1999, he was told to give up swimming. He didn't. He talks about why and how he overcame what was the conventional wisdom for athletes at the time. This week's show out right now is the story of Jack Tierney diagnosed in 1959 with type one. He is 81 and he told me he never feels, he's never felt better. Thanks for joining me and I will see you back here soon.